Welcome back everybody to lesson 43 of the Dead Earth Game Development Series. I'm Gary Simmons of the Game Institute and in this lesson we finally get to talk about something other than zombie AI. Over the next few lessons not only are we going to be putting together a robust audio solution for our game and looking at how to set up interactive scripts and store a game state but we're also going to do it in the context of something a little bit more fun. As I discussed in the last lesson, we're going to build a little mini game called Creeper. However, before I started this lesson, I noticed that although I'd upgraded the project to 2017.2 and everything was working fine, I did now have about 47 warning errors in my console window whenever I compiled scripts, which were mostly just warnings about deprecated function calls and properties being used. Most of these were being generated from having older versions of the standard assets, utility scripts. So what I decided to do before this lesson was upgrade those scripts to the latest versions to get rid of all of those deprecation warnings. So do make sure if you want to do that on your end, that you just go to the assets menu, you go to import package, and you just import cross-platform input and also utilities and that will just override the uh, the older cross-platform input scripts and the older utility scripts that are already in the project. However, there were a few deprecation warnings to do with my code that I hadn't actually noticed. Believe it or not, I'd actually had warnings turned off in the console window and didn't know about it, so I had all these warnings stacking up. Fortunately, all the warnings I was getting from my AI states was just down to one deprecated function call. So it was really, really easy to fix. Let me just tell you what I did. And when I say fix, I use the term loosely because what I was using before was deprecated and would probably be supported for some time to come in Unity. But, you know, they're advising you don't use deprecated function calls because they will eventually be withdrawn. So I'm going to drill down to my data folder. I'm going to drill down into my scripts folder and into my AI folder. And I'm going to open up my put control state. If I scroll down to the on enter state function, you will probably remember that one of the things that happens in the patrol state is as we enter this state, we set the destination and we just make sure that if the nav agent has been paused, then what we used to do was call its resume function. We used to say zombie state machine dot nav agent dot resume. The resume function is now deprecated and the recommended way of doing this is instead to set the is stopped property to false. So as you can see, I've literally just replaced zombie state machine dot nav agent dot resume with zombie state machine dot nav agent dot is stopped equals false. And I think we did this in about four of our states. So I was just able to find them via the console window, via those deprecation warnings, click on the line. It took me straight to it. And then I was able to uh, change to this. And that pretty much solved all of the deprecation warnings. I think I have like one or two warnings in there now for my own scripts, which are there kind of deliberately. Let me just go back to the editor and remind myself what they are. Yep, there they are. I have one warning in my character manager telling me that a character controller variable is assigned a value but never used and I also have a private field in my FPS controller called is jumping which is also set up and assigned a value but never actually used but the reason why I haven't removed those fields is because I do intend to use them later okay so those are warnings that I know about and I'm happy with Okay then, so the first order of business for you guys is to make sure that you head over to the resources section of the Dead Earth channel on the Game Institute website and you download the Lesson 43 Resources zip file. I have unpacked this zip file to my desktop, here it is. This folder contains all of the assets that we're going to need to build Creeper over the coming lessons. It contains mostly sound assets, but it also contains the model of the generator that we're going to need to turn on to restore the power. It's got a nice zombie font that we're going to use for our HUD and it's also got some textures that I use for us the keypad on the elevator uh, textures for uh, skybox that we're going to use and also textures for the computer screen in its activated and deactivated state so what we need to do is import all of these into our project now so that we've got them when we need them but we're not going to use all of these assets today but these are the resources we're going to be using over the coming lessons as we're building creeper okay so first of all we need to import the fonts from the fonts folder and and we want to put this in our dead earth folder in our project and in a fonts folder. Now we haven't got a fonts folder, so we don't have to worry about bringing the contents over so that it coexists with fonts we've already got. So we can just drag that fonts folder and drop it in our project view. Okay, so next up is the models folder. Now we've already got a models folder in our project. If we open that up, you can see we have all of our zombie characters in there from various companies. So what we want to do is open up the models folder in our downloaded resources and drag the scenery subfolder over 
and drop that in our models folder. If I open up the scenery folder, you can see we have a model in there called generator. There it is. The generator that we're going to place in the level and have to turn on to restore power. And of course, we, that contains the textures and the material as well. So that's that imported. Like I said, we won't be using that in this lesson, but we've got it in the project now for when we do wish to use it. Okay, so next up is the sounds folder, and there are loads of sounds here, mostly zombie sounds, mostly ones I've created myself. Uh, there's a couple that I was able to find free on the internet that I'm also going to use, and we also have some horror music that we're going to play in the background, and also an announcement message when power is restored. So we want to drag those into a sounds folder. Now, we already have a sounds folder in our Dead Earth folder, but if I open that up, we've currently got nothing in it, okay? So all we want to do is just open up the sounds folder from the downloaded resources, and just multiply select all of the folders and files in there and drag them into our sounds folder in our project view. Now this may take uh, a minute or so to import because there are a lot of sounds here. Also, I'm not going to step through the process of setting the import settings for all of these sounds just yet. We'll do that when and as we need them. Okay, so with those all imported, let's just check they actually work. So here's my music. And here's my announcement message when power has been restored. Attention all personnel. As you can see, that works. I also have some sounds here that the zombies are going to make when they're walking around. So you can see here's a, a roaming sound. <laughs> Loads of those, loads of different roaming sounds so that our zombies aren't all making the same sounds. And we've got some pain sounds as well. <sighs> so next up is the textures folder. And I was quite surprised when I opened up the textures folder in our project and expected just to see my blood effect textures that I also saw this skybox, which I intended to import in this lesson. What that basically means is at some point in the past when I was upgrading to 2017.2, I obviously imported these textures, set up the skybox and didn't know that I'd done it. So you've actually had this in the project all along. However, because I know some of you won't be using my project, you'll be building the project yourselves. I think what I'm gonna do just to keep everyone on the same page is I'm gonna delete the ones that are already in our textures folder I'm also going to go up to the materials and I'm going to delete that skybox material as well, which is also something else I didn't know that I had created. And we'll create that all later on when we start setting up the skybox textures and the skybox material for Creeper. Okay, so I'm going to select our textures folder once again in our project view. So you should just have my blood texture, my blood effect normal and Gary's face blood. Not quite sure what that is. And if I open up the textures folder from the downloads, you can see we have those two textures for the computer screen, a keypad that we're going to use on the elevator and those six skybox textures. The reason I want to import these skybox textures again is because I, I remember that when I first imported one of these, one of the faces was flipped around the wrong way. So I couldn't get them to line up without seams in the skybox material. And I wasn't sure whether the versions that were already in the project had been fixed, but I know these ones have because these are the exact ones that I used in Creeper. Okay, so let's drag all of these puppies into our textures folder. And now all of the resources that we need for Creeper are in our project. So now what we're going to do is start talking about how we use sound efficiently for a large game in Unity. So then, as I'm sure pretty much all of you will know, the basic building block of creating sound in our 3D worlds in Unity is the audio source component. At its simplest, if we wish a sound to be emitted from somewhere within our 3D world, we can simply create an empty game object, position that game object at a location wherever we wish the sound to be emitted from, and then add an audio source component to it. Of course, the audio source isn't the sound itself, but it's the mechanism by which an audio clip can be played and controlled. In order for that audio source to make a sound, we need to tell it which clip to play. So we can assign it a clip via its inspector, and I'll just choose any old clip here. Furthermore, we can also control whether Unity will automatically play this audio clip whenever the audio source's game object is awoken. And we can control whether it's a looping clip. We can control its priority, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. And we can control its volume, its pitch, its stereo pan. We can also control how it attenuates with distance. You can see here that I'm using the logarithmic roll-off, which is the more realistic roll-off. And I'm saying that this sound has a maximum distance of 500. Furthermore, we can also control how it responds to reverbs, and we can also determine whether this is going to be a 2D sound or a 3D sound via the spatial blend slider. 
Now, ordinarily, you would imagine a sound is either a 3D sound or a 2D sound, but using Unity's audio source component, we can actually set a sound as being a little mix of both. Usually, though, sounds will either be fully 3D or 2D. Most of the sounds we put in our scenes will be 3D sounds. We want Unity to control the attenuation such that when we walk further away from the sound, it gets quieter. We wish it to correctly position the sound so that when we have the sound to the left of us, it comes predominantly out of the left speaker. Of course, that doesn't mean we want every sound to be a 3D sound. Background music, for example, you don't want that to get further away from the player. You want that to have a constant volume. And also UI sounds are also good candidates for being fully 2D on the spatial blend slider. So in any given game, it stands to reason that there's going to be an awful lot of sounds that need to be played. Even if we had just 10 zombies, each zombie is going to need to play footstep sounds for each foot that hits the floor. It's going to need to play groaning sounds, attack sounds, damage sounds, perhaps swiping and feeding sounds. And then of course we have the sounds that the player is going to make. It's footsteps, it's damage sounds, sounds of a weapon firing or a crowbar being swung. And then of course you have all of the scene sounds themselves. For example, in Creeper we have like an engine sound for when the generator's been activated. We also have an announcement being made over a PA system telling us that we're in lockdown. But of course, in a bigger game, you might have the sound of like birds tweeting, of a river or a waterfall flowing, lots of background sounds as well. Fortunately, in more recent versions of Unity, Unity Technologies introduced the audio mixer, a much needed feature that was missing in earlier versions of Unity. The audio mixer gives us a really simple and nice way to take all of the audio sources of a given type and group them together such that we can apply modifications to their volume as a group. So for example, we might take all of the zombie sounds and assign those to the zombie group. We might take all of the player sounds and assign them to the player group. We might take all of the background scenery sounds and assign those to a group called the scenery group. And then, using the audio mixer, we can very easily control, for example, the volume of all those groups relative to one another. I can't tell you how important this is. Back in Unity 3.5, I developed a racing game for GI called GI Racing 1. As I got towards the end of product development, and I was getting ready to do my final build, I then decided that I would fine-tune the various levels of the different types of audio in the game. Some people I asked said they would like the engine sounds a bit quieter, some said they would like the scenery sounds louder. I suddenly realized that because my application was using hundreds of audio sources just spread throughout all of my scenes and not logically grouped into any kind of category, the only way I could adjust these volumes was a trial and error process of painstakingly loading in all of my scenes, finding all of the audio sources and adjusting their individual volumes. The hardship could be made a little less by using prefabs in many cases, but even so, it was still a laborious task. Perhaps more importantly though, I wanted to expose an audio options page so that the user of the game could configure the various sound settings themselves so they could control how loud the car engine sounds were to the crash sounds and how loud they were relative to the scenery sounds. Unity provided no means of me being able to do this. So instead I had to write an audio manager that essentially encapsulated the entire functionality of a multi-track mixing desk. All of the audio sources in my scene would register themselves with the audio manager and tell the audio manager what track they were on. My audio manager would maintain a list of track structures where each track would have a name and a list of audio sources that had been registered with it. Then, when I wanted to change the volume of, say, the car engine's track, my audio manager could iterate through all of the audio sources that had been assigned to that track and apply that multiplier to their individual volumes. This was a bit of a pain in the ass to develop and just not something we want to do when we're making our game. Fortunately, we no longer have to because Unity provides this functionality out of the box via the audio mixer. So let's create an audio mixer for our game now. I should note that a single game could use multiple audio mixers, but we're only going to use one. Our audio mixer is also going to be quite simple. It's going to have a couple of tracks, one for player sounds, one for zombie sounds, one for UI sounds whenever we get around to putting UI into our game, and also one for scenery sounds. So I'm going to create my audio mixer in my assets folder. I'm going to right click, and from the context menu, I'm going to choose to create an audio mixer. I'm just going to call my audio mixer, audio mixer because we're only going to have one in the game. I'm then going to double click on the audio mixer and that will open up the audio mixer tab. Currently, our audio mixer only has one track called the master track. At the moment though, that sound that we added to our scene just now 
and footstep sounds on our FPS controller rig haven't been assigned to any of the channels on this mixer. Now, before we start adding channels, let me just say that if you're from a live music background or from a studio recording background, you're probably pretty familiar with multi-track mixing desks. In Unity, they're not called tracks or channels, they're called audio mixer groups. This may sound kind of weird, but it makes sense because they're much more flexible than a standard track on a mixing desk. In fact, if you are from an audio background, you can think of the audio mixer groups as really being output buses. We can channel as many of the audio sources in our scene into one of these audio mixer groups and then have control over its volume. Furthermore, we can actually cascade these things in a hierarchy if we want, so the output of two or three mixer groups could be fed in as the input to another mixer group, which then gets further mixed or has effects applied to it before it's routed to the final master audio mixer group. The output of the master audio mixer group is, of course, the output of the mixer itself and the sound that we hear in our game. So let's create some additional mixer groups that we think we're going to need in our game. In order to do that, I'm going to, from the audio mixer window, click on the little plus sign next to where it says groups. You'll notice under this it lists the groups this mixer currently has. It only has one, the master fader. So I'm going to click on the plus sign next to where it says groups to add a new audio mixer group, a new track if you like, to our mixing desk. I'm going to call this Scenery. This is the audio mixer group that we're going to assign sounds such as our power generator to or any other background sounds. Notice that the scenery audio mixer group has been created as a child of the master audio mixer group. This means that we'll have individual control over the various categories of sound in our game, but we'll also have a master control to turn all of the sounds up and down. So next up, I want to create another audio mixer group that will put all of the player sounds on. Now, it's very important when you create a mixer group that you choose the mixer group that you've already created that you want it to be a child of. Now in my case, I want all of the audio mixer groups that I create to be direct children of the master. In other words, the sound that comes out of each audio mixer group will be fed into the master, so we finally have a master mix of it all. But if I was to create another audio mixer group with the scenery mixer group selected, like so, what I've got here is a mixer group which is a child of the scenery mixer group. So now the settings of the scenery mixer group will also affect any of its child groups, such as our new group here. This is pretty useful, it allows you to create complete hierarchies of audio mixer groups, but not something we're going to use. So I'm going to delete that new group that I just created. I'm going to make sure I've got the master audio group selected, and I'm going to create another direct child of that, and I'm going to call this player. This is what all the player's sounds are going to be assigned to. Selecting the master group again, I'm going to press the plus sign, and I'm going to create another one called zombies. And then once again, finally selecting the master audio group again, create one more direct child of that, and I'm going to call this UI. We haven't got any UI sounds yet, but I'm sure we will when our game gets much nearer to completion. Actually, I'm going to change the name of the scenery audio mixer group, and I think I'm going to rename that just scene. That's where scene sounds go. Actually, I'm going to create one more audio mixer group for music as well. So once again, I must remember to first of all select the master group because that's the group I want this group to be a child of. And I'm going to call this music. And that seems to be really all the audio mixer groups we need for Dead Earth. Now, if I turn off my zombies for a moment, you'll remember that at the beginning of this lesson, I added this computer download sound audio source. If I press play, when you hear the computer download sound play, you'll notice that none of it is registering in our audio mixer. And that's because that audio source has not been assigned to our audio mixer at all. So how do we assign it to our audio mixer? Well, we don't really assign it to the mixer, we assign it to the audio mixer groups. And if you look at the audio source component, you'll notice that there is a property called output. In other words, what audio mixer group do we wish this audio source to output its sound to? If I click on the output selector, hey, look at that. It's our audio mixer with all of the audio mixer groups that we've created. So that sound that I've added is a scenery sound. So let me assign that to the scene audio mixer group. When I press play now and call up the audio mixer window, Notice that we can see the sound levels of that scene audio mixer group. And we can also see that we're getting a sound registered on the master group as well, because of course the output from the scene audio mixer group is the input to the master audio mixer group. 
So to check this works, let me add another sound to the scene by just duplicating that temporary game object we created at the beginning of this lesson. And I'll assign a different sound to this. What shall I assign? I will assign some horror music. Yeah. And of course, I'm going to assign this to the music audio group. When I press play now, and bring up the audio mixer tab, you'll notice that we can see the music signal registering in the music audio group, the scene sound, that computer download sound, registering on the scene audio mixer group, and of course the output from both those groups is being output into the master group. So how do we change the volumes of these things when we're editing? Well, we just click that little button that says edit in play mode, and you'll notice that the faders now all become alive and selectable. So if I wish to turn the music up, I can to turn it off I can, so if I want to turn up the scene sounds I can, and of course this will affect any audio sources in the scene that have been assigned to the scene audio mixer group, so just by moving that fader up we could have a hundred sounds in our scene assigned to that audio mixer group and we found a really nice way to do a master mix for our game. And just to demonstrate the fact that all of these children send their outputs into the master audio mixer group, I can of course boost both the music and the scene level by moving up and down my master fader. Okay, so we now have a really easy way to add audio sources to our scene and at that point assign them to the audio mixer group to which they belong so that we have a master mixer that allows us at any time to go back and tweak the various levels of the various categories. What's even better though is that the audio mixer has a scriptable API so that we can talk to the audio mixer via our scripts and have our scripts alter the volumes of the various audio mixer groups. Of course, audio mixer groups provide us with much more flexibility than just being able to control the volumes of subcategories of sounds. On a per audio mixer group basis, we can also add any of Unity's supported audio effects, reverbs, distortions, parametric EQs, choruses and compressors. Of course, we're not going to be doing any of that just yet, but you'll see later that we will assign some reverbs to some of our groups, such as our scene sounds, our zombie sounds, and our player sounds, but we won't want those reverbs to affect our UI sounds or our background music. It's worth mentioning as well that if you're performing a mix in edit mode by clicking play and then selecting that edit in play mode button, you can also solo out what's on a given channel by pressing the S button. This will mute all of the other audio mixer groups so you can hear just the audio mixer group that you've decided to solo. Conversely, you can also decide to mute an audio mixer group. So if I decide to mute the scene group, we should hear that computer download sound stop. And now all we can hear is the background music. So this is really, really nice, and I can't tell you what a welcome addition to Unity the audio mixer was for me, given my previous development experience. Of course, another great thing about being able to talk to the audio mixer from our scripts is that it makes it delightfully easy for us to create an audio options UI page in our game that contains a series of sliders, one slider for each audio mixer group. And when the user chooses to drag that slider either up or down, we can just make the changes to the volume of the associated and connected audio mixer group. However, configuring our audio mixer so that our scripts can alter the volumes of its audio mixer groups at runtime is a little bit weird and takes a bit of getting used to. You see, if I select one of those temporary game objects that we added at the beginning of this lesson, we can see that an audio source can maintain a reference to an audio mixer group. In this case, we can see the audio source maintains a reference to the scene audio mixer group. So if our scripts can maintain references to audio mixer groups, you would imagine that the audio mixer group API might have a function called set volume or get volume. But actually it doesn't work like that. The audio mixer group class has virtually no exposed functions that we can use. Instead, we change the parameters of the audio mixer, much like we change the parameters of Unity's animator component. The audio mixer has functions such as get float and set float, much as Unity's animator does. And we have to choose which properties of audio mixer groups get exposed to the audio mixer as parameters that our scripts can access. At the moment, if you look in the top right corner of our audio mixer window, you can see it says exposed parameters zero. That means at the moment, our audio mixer doesn't have any parameters that we can change via script. In order to make our volumes accessible such that our scripts can access them, we need to expose them from the audio mixer groups as parameters to the audio mixer, then give them a name. Then in our scripts, we can say things, for example, such as audio mixer dot set float, 
And then we pass in the name of the parameter we wish to change, which might be something like scene or volume. And then the value, of course, for that volume. So what we want to do is expose all of the volumes of our audio mixer groups, even our master group. So how do we do that? Well, we have to expose the volume parameter and decide what we're going to call that parameter. So to do that, we have to select the audio mixer group that has the parameter or parameters we wish to expose. And as we select it, we can see in its inspector what properties it has. You can see we have the pitch property and the volume property. What I want to expose is the volume property. So I right click on the volume in the inspector and I choose to expose this as a parameter to the audio mixer. Now you can see there's this little black arrow next to the volume property in the inspector, which lets me know this is an exposed parameter. You can also see in the top right corner of the audio mixer group, it now says exposed parameters one. And if I left click on that to drop it down, you can see that by default, it assigned this parameter the name my exposed param. We're obviously going to want to give this a much more useful name. And you can see next to this in the light gray writing, it reminds us what this parameter actually is by saying this is a volume parameter of the scene audio mixer group. So we want to give this a decent but unique name. We don't really want to call it volume because all of our faders are going to have volume. Now, I'm not really sure what happens if I was to expose all of the volumes of my audio mixer groups with the name volume then I would essentially have six parameters all with the name of volume. And I'm not really sure how that works. I'm guessing that if we say set float volume to turn the volume down, it would probably change the volume of all of the audio mixer groups. But uh, I don't care because that's not the way I'm going to do it anyway. What I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to expose the volume of each audio mixer group with the name of the audio mixer group. Because all I really care about in my game and in my audio options UI is controlling the volume of these channels. That's all I really need to do at runtime. So what I can do is I can say, well, I want the volume parameter of the scene to be called scene. And I want the volume parameter of the player to be called player. So at runtime in my scripts, I could say audio mixer group set float scene 10 and that would set the volume of the scene channel to 10. So as I've exposed the volume of the scene audio mixer group, let me now right click on that in the exposed parameters list and rename it and call it exactly the same name as the audio mixer group. I'm now going to select my master fader from the inspector, right click on the volume, choose to expose that as a parameter as well. I'm going to select my player audio mixer group. I'm going to expose its volume. I'm going to do, of course, the same for the zombie audio mixer group, the same for the UI audio mixer group, and the same for the music audio mixer group. Then I'm going to rename all of these parameters. So you can see the first one is the volume of master. So I'm going to call that master. The second one in the list is the parameter that controls the volume of my music channel. So I'm going to call this music. Third one is the volume of my player channel. So I'm going to call this player. Very important, you'll see in a minute, that I do actually call these the exact same name, spelling, and capitalization that I've called the audio mixer group. Because in a minute, we're going to create an audio manager that is going to kind of wrap the audio mixer and make it very easy for us to do channel fades over time and to control the audio mixer much more simply than actually talking to the audio mixer directly. Um, what else have I got here? Oh, I've got my UI, so I'm going to rename that UI. And finally, I've got my zombies audio mixer group, so I want to call Call that zombies. Okay, so just so we all understand what's going on, we now have an audio mixer that has six parameters master, music, player, scene, UI, and zombies. At runtime, we can get or set the volume of any of our audio mixer groups by simply using get float and set float, using any of these exposed parameters as the name of the parameter we wish to change, and then passing in the new value that we wish to assign to that audio mixer group. Okay, so our audio mixer is now fully set up and ready to be used by our game. However, like I said, rather than maintaining references to the audio mixer in all of my various scenes that might wish to interact with the audio mixer, I'm going to create an audio manager singleton that is going to maintain the single reference to the audio mixer and just implement some simple functions in that that allow us to set and get the volume of a track. And furthermore, the function that we expose in our audio manager that allows us to set the volume will also allow us to set that over time. So we can say, I want you to change the volume of the zombie sounds to this volume over five seconds. And that will animate using a coroutine this parameter of the zombie track over a five second period. 
Over the coming lessons, you're going to see that our audio manager is going to do much more than just be a light wrapper around the audio mixer. It's going to create audio pooling and layered audio sources, and, and we're going to be building up our audio mixer class over the coming lessons with more and more functionality. So let's start writing our audio manager script now. Oh, before I forget, let me delete those two game objects that we temporarily added to the scene just while we were testing our audio mixer. So I'm going to select them both in the hierarchy and then choose delete. I'm then going to select my project window and I'm going to drill down into my scripts folder and I'm going to create a new subfolder for handling scripts that are to do with sound and I'm going to call this audio. I'm then going to drill down into the audio folder, right click, choose to create a C-sharp script. I'm then going to call this script audio manager and then I'm going to double click on the audio manager to open it up in mono develop. So here I am in my audio manager script in mono develop and because we're going to be using the audio mixer API this is all contained in the unity engine.audio namespace so first thing we need to make sure we do that at the top of our file we add using unity engine.audio the audio manager like I said is also going to be a singleton so we're going to implement that same singleton pattern that we've seen before. I'm going to have a private static variable of type audio manager called instance with an underscore. This will be set to null initially. I'm also going to have a public static audio manager property called instance without the underscore. This will only be a getter and as you can see the first time anything tries to access the instance property if our private instance variable is null then it means that we don't have a reference we haven't found that audio manager component in our scene yet so we use unity's find object of type function telling it we wish to look for the first reference to an audio manager in our scene which it, if it finds will return and store in our private instance variable. Finally we return the instance. Of course every other time after the first time that any script tries to access the instance property our private instance variable will not be null and this expensive search through the scene will not need to be done. So let's talk about some of the inspector variables that we're going to need. Only one at the moment, and that's going to be of type audio mixer. We need to give the audio manager a reference to our audio mixer so that it can talk to it. So the way this is going to work is in the startup function, the audio manager is going to talk to the audio mixer and it's going to say, give me a list of all of your audio mixer groups. So we're going to want a data structure that allows us to represent an audio mixer group and some other properties as well. So let's create that data structure now. So just above my declaration for my audio manager, I'm going to create a new public class called track info. Notice that although Unity calls them audio mixer groups, I'm still going to call them tracks in my audio manager. A track info object will store all of the information we need about one audio mixer group. And then in our audio manager, we will store all of the track info objects in a dictionary so we can access them easily by name. So the first property of my track info will be a string that I've called name and I'll set this to an empty string by default. But this will contain the name of the audio mixer group that's been assigned to it. The next property that we store is the audio mixer group itself, which once again, we will fetch from the audio mixer in the start function. Finally, we wish all of our tracks to be able to perform coroutines that will animate the audio mixer group's volume over time. Therefore, we need a clean way to start a coroutine for a given track and also stop a coroutine for just that track. This is quite important because if, for example, script A says to the audio manager, I want you to perform a 10 second fade of the zombie track to a certain volume, but then two seconds later, another script somewhere else issues a different command for that track we're going to need to abort the coroutine that's running already for just that track and start the new coroutine we certainly don't want to say stop all coroutines because that would stop all of the coroutines on the game object including the coroutines that might be running legitimately for other tracks that are being animated so storing a reference to the I enumerator, the coroutine instance, if you like, for this track, means that we can easily start, stop, and check if a coroutine is running for just that track. So with our track info object complete, let's now add another private variable to our audio manager class, which is going to be a dictionary. This dictionary is going to store a string as its key, which will be the name of a track, the name of an audio mixer group, and the track info object that we create for that audio mixer group as its value. I've called this dictionary tracks. My audio manager is also going to be a don't destroy on load object. 
That is to say that it will not be destroyed when a scene is loaded. This is quite important because eventually we're going to add an audio source itself to the audio manager game object that can be used to play music. Of course, normally when you do a scene load in Unity, all of the objects in the previous scene get destroyed as well as any audio sources. So if we were using just a scene audio source to play the music, then when we transition from the main menu into the game, any music that was playing on the main menu would be destroyed and would stop playing. So by making our audio manager a don't destroy on load object, we can make sure that we fire up the audio manager in the menu scene. And then when we click to go through to the game, even if the game takes 10 seconds to load, we can have some music playing on the audio manager and the audio manager won't be destroyed and the music will carry on playing while the player is waiting for the scene to load. However, I like to do don't destroy on load in the awake function. So I think I'm going to put all of the startup code for my audio manager, not in the start function, but in the awake function instead. And the first line that I'm going to issue is, of course, Unity's don't destroy on load function, passing in the game object that this audio manager script is attached to. Next up, I need to make sure that I have a valid reference to an audio mixer. If we forgot to assign that via the inspector, then there's nothing this object can do. It doesn't have an audio mixer to talk to. The next thing we want to do is get references to all of the audio mixer groups that are in our mixer. To do that, we use the audio mixers find matching groups method. This method can be passed a string and we'll do a search through the audio mixer groups and return an array of any audio mixer groups that have a matching name. I wish to get all of the audio mixer groups, so I just pass in an empty string. This function will return an array of audio mixer groups, which I've called groups. Now that we have our audio mixer groups array, I can set up a for each loop to iterate through those audio mixer groups. In each iteration of the loop, I'm going to allocate a new track info object and copy over all of the information from the audio mixer group that I wish to store. So inside the loop itself, the first thing I would do is allocate a new track info object for the audio mixer group we're currently processing. I'm then going to fetch the name of the audio mixer group. As you can see, the audio mixer group has the name property, which I store in my track info's name property. Of course, this will also be the name of the parameter in the audio mixer group that we wish to use when we wish to change the volume of that audio mixer group. I also store a reference to the audio mixer group itself. And finally, I set the track info's track fader I enumerator to null because we haven't started a coroutine yet. With our track info object now allocated and set up to represent the audio mixer group that we're currently processing, the next thing we wish to do is add this track info object to our tracks dictionary, using the name of the audio mixer group as the key, and the track info object itself, of course, as the value. And that's our awake function done. I don't have any code that I would like to add to the update function just yet, but I'm going to leave the stub in place, because in future lessons we will actually be adding some code there. The next function that I want to create is going to be the coroutine that is going to be used to animate the volume of an audio mixer group. This is going to be a protected function. This isn't a function that's going to be called by our external scripts. Instead, we're going to wrap the coroutine in non-coroutine functions. I like to do that. I don't want to be in a situation where if, for example, my scripts wish to set the volume of an audio mixer group, they have to remember to call start coroutine. Instead, I make the coroutine internal and then make a wrapper function that just calls the coroutine. Another advantage of doing this is we may find in many cases that we don't wish to perform a timed fade of the volume of the audio mixer group. We wish to just assign that new volume directly, in which case that wrapper function doesn't need to invoke the coroutine at all, but can feed that parameter directly into the audio mixer. So my coroutine is called set track volume internal. And of course, because it's a coroutine, it returns an I enumerator and it takes three parameters. The first parameter is the name of the track, in quotes, the audio mixer group that we wish to set the volume for. The second parameter is the volume that we wish to set it to. Is the third parameter, the fade time, the time in seconds that we wish the animation of the audio mixer group's volume to be performed over. The first thing I'm going to do is allocate some local variables of type float. The first I've called start volume is going to be used to record what the current volume of the audio mixer group is prior to the fade happening. We need to know the volume that we're fading from. The second local variable is probably no surprise to you. It's called timer. It's going to be used to keep track of the time that has elapsed since this coroutine has been running. Of course, when timer reaches or surpasses the fade time, we know that it's time to exit the coroutine. So the first thing we're going to do is use the audio mixers get float function to get what the current volume of the audio mixer group is. The first parameter to the get float function is the name of the parameter in the audio mixer we wish to fetch the value for. 
Now, in our case, we've set the volumes of all of our audio mixer groups to be exposed as parameters with the name of the audio mixer group. So simply passing in the name of our track, our audio mixer group, will get us what we need. As the second parameter, I pass in that start volume as an out parameter, so that on function return, start volume will contain the actual volume of the audio mixer group as it is at the moment prior to the animation running. Next up, I create a while loop, which is going to continuously iterate until the timer variable exceeds or reaches the fade time variable. In each iteration of our loop, we make sure that we update our timer variable with the currently passed time. Notice though, I'm not using time.delta time here. I'm using time.unscaled delta time. The reason I'm using unscaled delta time is there are often times when we wish time to travel more slowly in Unity, and we can set the scale at which time passes. For example, one commonly used trick to pause a game in all of those animated particle systems is just to set the time scale to zero. In the case of my track fades though, I don't want them to be affected by this. I always want them to animate in real time, irrespective of whether the game is paused or not. This of course is a personal choice that you can make. Okay, so now that we've updated our timer, it's time to set the volume of our audio mixer group in each iteration of the loop. Now, as you can see, in each iteration, we call the audio mixer set float function, passing in the name of the parameter we wish to alter, which is of course the name of our audio mixer group. And then I perform a loop from that starting volume the volume that our audio mixer group was at before we started this while loop to the volume that we specified as the second parameter to this function. And as the T value, we simply divide timer by the fade time. I should probably put some code in here that checks that we don't pass in a fade time of zero. But as this function is only internal, I'm going to make sure that the wrapper function that calls it does that check for me. In fact, it will detect if fade time is zero, and if it is, it won't bother calling this coroutine at all. It will instead just do the set float assignment directly. Finally, with respect to our while loop, we need to make sure that at the end of each iteration, we remember to yield return null so that we don't tie up our animation in a horrid loop. If we've requested to do a 20 second fade, we wish all of those other objects in our scene to still get all of their callbacks, still be able to do all of their animations over that 20 second period. Finally, outside the loop, I just make sure that as the animation is now over, we set the volume of our track to that volume that was passed in as the parameter. Should be pretty much that anyway, but because of floating point inaccuracies, it might be slightly off, so we just need to nudge it to exactly the right volume. So that's our coroutine done. What I'm going to do now is write the public wrapper function that is going to call this function. That's the function that's going to be called by the other scripts in our scene when they wish to set the volume of a track. So this public function I've called set track volume. It has a void return type, and of course it takes the same three parameters that our coroutine does. The name of the audio mixer group that we wish to change the volume of, the volume that we would wish to change it to, and the fade time which defaults to zero. Inside the function, we'll first make sure we have a valid reference to an audio mixer. If we don't, nothing we can do, so we just return. The next thing I need to do is make sure that the name of the audio mixer group that we've been passed as the first parameter does exist in our tracks dictionary so that I can use the dictionary's try get value function passing in as the key to the dictionary the name of our audio mixer group and of course as the second parameter a track info variable that if successfully found will contain a reference to the track info object. Remember, try get value returns false if the track we've specified doesn't exist in our dictionary. So we only get inside this conditional if track info does represent a valid object. So the first thing we want to make sure is that if there is a coroutine running for this track, then we stop it. So you can see I say if track info dot track fader doesn't equal null, then stop coroutine track info dot track fader. Next up, you can see that I check the value of fade time, and if fade time is zero, then we don't wish to start our coroutine at all. We can simply use the audio mixer set float function to set the parameter, which in this case is the name of our audio mixer group, directly to the volume passed. However, if fade time is not zero, then we will assign to our track info's track fader I enumerator variable our set track volume internal function, passing in the track, the volume, the fade time. Remember, although I've assigned this function to our I enumerator, it hasn't started yet. In order to do that, I have to call Unity's start coroutine function, passing in that I enumerator. So that is our set track volume function done. Next up, we probably want to have a get track volume as well, so that any script can inquire about the current volume of an audio mixer group. So I'm going to create a public function called get track volume, takes a single parameter, the name of the track slash audio mixer group we wish to retrieve the volume for. And of course, because this needs to return a volume, it has a float return type. 
Inside the function, we use our tracks dictionaries try get value function again, passing in the name of the track as the key to get out our track info object. Once we have our track info object, we use the audio mixer's get float function, passing in the name of our track. And as the second parameter, we pass in as an out parameter a float variable that I've called volume here. That on function return will contain the volume of our audio mixer group and then we simply return that volume. Of course, if the name of the track that we've passed in doesn't match a key in our tracks dictionary, then all we do is return float min value, the smallest value that can be represented by the float type. It might also be useful to have a function that allows any script to actually get the underlying audio mixer group reference for a track. I'm not sure I use this in Creeper, but I can certainly see how it might be beneficial to be able to do this later on in development. So I create a public function called get audio group from track name. It returns an audio mixer group reference, and as its only parameter takes the name of the track, we would like to have the audio mixer group reference returned for. Inside the function, we call our dictionary's try get value function again, passing in the name of the track that we are searching for. And if a track info object exists in that dictionary with that name, we're going to have that returned in this local variable here called ti. And then we just return the group member of our track info structure, which remember is what stores the reference to the audio mixer group. If we were unable to find a track info object in our dictionary with the requested name, we simply return null as the audio mixer group reference. And that is our audio manager completed for this lesson. In the next lesson and future lessons, we're going to add more functionality to this. But in this lesson, we're just concentrating on being able to control the audio mixer from script. So I'm going to go back to the editor and just check I haven't got any errors. And then I'm going to write a little temporary script to check that our audio manager is indeed working and doing what it's supposed to do. So in the audio folder of my scripts folder, next to where I have my audio manager script created, I'm going to create a temporary c -sharp script, which I'm going to call audio manager test. I'm going to create an empty game object in my scene, and I'm going to add my audio manager test to it. I'm then going to open up the audio manager test in mono develop. I'm going to nuke the update function. I'm just going to issue a command to our audio manager to perform a track fade over five seconds from the start function. So in the start function, the first thing I'm going to say is if audio manager dot instance. In other words, if an instance of the audio manager does exist on a game object in our scene, which by the way, it doesn't yet. We need to remember to add that in a minute. Then I'm going to call it set track volume function. So I'll say audio manager dot instance dot set track volume and we wish to change the volume of the zombies track and we wish to set the volume to 10 and we wish to perform this fade over five seconds like so that is that script done of course this won't work just yet because we haven't added an audio manager to our scene so actually what i'll do is i'll just put my audio manager on the same game object as the audio manager test and of course, our audio manager script is going to need a reference to our audio mixer. So I'm going to open up the audio mixer picker and assign our audio mixer to my audio manager script. In fact, I'm going to move my game window up there just temporarily because I keep losing my audio mixer window whenever I press play. And I'm going to select my audio mixer. And when I press play now, keep an eye on the zombies volume. We should see it animate up to 10 over five seconds. There it is. Look, it's going up. Cool. So any script in our scene can now change the volumes of any of our audio mixer groups. So I'm going to select that game object that I thought I had temporarily created. But I'm actually going to keep it hanging around because this is now going to be our audio manager game object. The game object that our audio manager script is attached to. But I am going to remove the audio manager test because we now know that that works. So I'm going to leave it there for this lesson. In the next lesson, we're going to extend our audio manager by creating a pool of audio sources so that we can play one shot audio clips efficiently without having to have lots of instantiation and garbage collection. We're also going to talk about how Unity manages to stay within the hardware limitations of all of the audio requests that you might make and how it prioritizes sounds using a virtual sound system. And we're going to emulate that ourselves to a certain extent in our audio manager when we're managing our pool of one-shot audio sources. Now, if none of that made sense to you, don't worry about it. We'll talk about it at the beginning of the next lesson. Thanks for listening, guys. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye now.